thank you for coming. This is, I think, the last of our seminar series for the Division of Biostatistics this, semester, this academic year, that's right. Um, today, I'm really happy to present my friend and colleague, Dr. Leslie McClure. Um, Dr. Leslie McClure is an Associate Professor of Biostatistics and Director of Graduate Studies in Biostatistics at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Prior to that, Dr. McClure earned her PhD in Biostatistics at the University of Michigan in 2004 and prior to that, earned an MS in Preventative Medicine and Environmental Health from the University of Iowa in 1997. She is a clinical trial statistician by training and PI of the Secondary Prevention of Small Subcortical Stroke Statistical Center, but also, in her own words, moonlights as, a, as an environmental epidemiologist, currently having some research funding to examine environmental risk factors for stroke. Some of her research linking sunlight exposure to stroke risk recently gained national media attention after it was presented at the American Stroke Association meeting in New Orleans this past February. In addition, Dr. McClure recently received the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching at the School of Public Health at UAB. I first met Leslie in 1997 at the University of Michigan when she entered the PhD program in biostatistics one year after I did, so we were classmates. She and I have grown together from graduate students juggling coursework, dissertation research, and intramural sports to professors juggling strong and challenging careers with the joys and responsibilities of family and motherhood. Leslie is exemplary to young women entering our field as biostatisticians in academia. She is exemplary for success, so I'm very proud to introduce my friend and colleague, Leslie McClure. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, the secondary prevention of small subcortical stroke study. As Sherry mentioned, I'm the PI of the Statistical Center for this study, and so I'm going to go through a couple, I'm going to introduce the study and then go through a couple of examples of some of the, about the study itself, and then a couple of the examples of methods of work that we've done uh, throughout the course of the study that have been motivated by real problems that arose during the course of the trial. So I'll begin, as I mentioned, with some background about the study and then talk about the study design itself. I'll follow with some uh, research we've done about interim futility analysis and then some sample size re-estimation. So interestingly, I just came here from the Society for Clinical Trials <coughs> meetings and adaptive designs were a really hot topic. So I'll talk a little bit about how we did a, a mid-study adapt adaptation to our study. And then I'll end with some discussion and conclusions and give you an update on where we are now with SPS3. So for some background, according to the Center for Disease Control, stroke was the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. in 2009. And in fact, when I last talked about stroke and stroke background, it was the third leading cause of death. So we've actually made some ground with preventing stroke, or perhaps people who are studying COPD have lost ground. But stroke's now the fourth leading cause of death in our country, and the number one cause of long-term adult disability as well. About a third of stroke survivors have a recurrent stroke within five years and about 14% within one year of their stroke. So stroke recurrence is a, a huge issue among people who suffer from a first stroke. Understanding prevention of stroke and um, again among stroke survivors how to re prevent recurrent stroke is a topic of much research and in fact the man who just walked in the room has done a lot of this research. Uh, Antihypertensive medications are recommended for secondary stroke prevention among those who have suffered for uh, suffered an ischemic stroke or a trans ischemic, uh, trans -ischemic trans attack. But lifestyle modifications are also recommended. As with most chronic diseases or most acute diseases, diet modification, quitting smoking, and exercise. In addition, a lot of research has been uh, undergone to examine the role of antiplatelet therapy in the prevention of recurrent stroke for those suffering from specific stroke sub subtype, subtypes, excuse me, including the, the benefits of aspirin, the benefits of Plavix or clopidogrel and others as well, and in combination as well. However, at the time that SPS3 was designed, it's not been well understood how far blood pressure should be lowered to best prevent recurrent stroke. So some of the guidelines provide recommendations to lowering blood pressure below 140, below 130, depending on concomitant diseases, but it wasn't well known at the time how far is, 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 is further better, essentially. Additionally, some research has, a lot of research has been done into combination anti-platelet anti therapy, but not, 
But there's not been conclusive research yet whether or not combination antiplatelet therapy or which antiplatelet therapies are most effective at reducing the risk of recurrent strokes. So the Secondary Prevention of Small Subcortical Strokes, or SPS3 study, was designed to help address both of these issues. SPS3 is a multi-center, multinational, randomized clinical trial with goals of assessing whether the combination of aspirin and clopidogrel, two antiplatelet therapies, are uh, more effective <coughs> at reducing the risk of recurrent stroke than aspirin alone, as well as whether or not the risk of recurrent stroke will differ for those randomized to two different blood pressure targets. So we randomized people to a usual target range, which is 130 to 140, that should be 149, excuse me, and to intensive blood pressure lowering, so blood pressure below 130. SPS3 is simply um, has structure as such. So the clinical coordinating center is directed by Oscar Benavente, and that's at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And um, you can see in the, in the graphic here that most of the day-to-day -day execution of the study from a clinical perspective is maintained there. The statistical center is managed by me at UAB, and we're responsible for all of the data issues, data entry and quality. We uh, drew up the randomization scheme. We do interim reporting. We interact with the DSMB for safety issues, also for futility. And we're currently undertaking a lot of analyses. Um, the Drug Distribution Center for the study was located at the VA Cooperative Studies Center in uh, New Mexico, and then there were 84 clinical sites where all of the patients were seen and all of the medical management was done. So SPS3 assessed stroke recurrence among patients with a particular stroke subtype, lacunar strokes, and patients were randomized in a factorial design to one of four treatment groups. So one of each of the blood pressure control targets and combination antiplatelet therapy or aspirin. So our goal was to get equal allocation to each of those four cells. So SPS3 essentially consists of two randomized multicenter trials uh, simultaneously to assess the impact on recurrent stroke for, from each of these therapies. So the antiplatelet therapy, again, which was aspirin versus aspirin plus clopidogrel or Plavix or control of blood pressure, uh, control of systolic blood pressure. So as many of you probably already know, the benefit of doing a factorial design is that you get to study both of these treatments in a single population simultaneously. SPS3 has 3,020 participants located all over the, well, all over North America, uh, South America, and in Spain. So um, about 350 came from Spain, a chunk came from Peru and Ecuador, Chile and Argentina, and then U.S. and Canada, uh, and Mexico as well. So it's, it's a multinational uh, study. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the design for SPS3, because this sort of is the starting point for some of the methods work we've been doing. So SPS3, the sample size was determined considering our primary outcome as subsequent stroke, and that encompassed both ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke. We plan to use a Kaplan-Meier or log rank test, and we assessed power to assuming a 7% a seven percent annual event rate in the single therapy group, the aspirin group alone. And I'll tell you about this in a minute, uh, later in the talk, but this came from, at the time SPS3 was uh, designed, which was in 2002, this came from published rates that were in the literature at the time. We assumed that we'd have about a 10% 10, 10 loss to follow-up, and we planned for two interim analyses, so we accounted for that in our alpha spending. And so given a sample size of 2,500, we had 90% power to detect a 25% relative risk reduction attributable to aspirin and clitoral together. Okay, so we made the assumption at the time that we powered the study that combination therapy would be better than monotherapy. Uh, we would also have 80% power to detect a 20% relative risk reduction. So we planned for 90% power with a larger risk reduction with hopes that, that if the re risk reduction were in fact lower, we'd still have sufficient power to detect a treatment difference of interest. We did a similar calculation um, for the blood pressure arm. Again, our primary outcome was subsequent stroke. We were planning a similar type of analysis, and we assumed a, a lower event rate in the usual group 
And um, we expect a larger difference for blood pressure control than for antiplatelet therapy control. And so we, with this sample size, we were ensured at least 90% power again to detect a 25 relative risk 25% redu relative risk reduction attributable to the intensive blood pressure control group. In fact, when we did this power calculation, we assumed a two-sided test. We didn't know that intensive blood pressure lowering would necessarily be better. Uh, I'll get to this at the end, but we still don't know yet. Um, we're not there yet. Okay, so based on the, the data and the literature at the time, SPS3 was designed assuming no interaction between the antiplatelet and blood pressure arms. So the study was powered not to detect a significant interaction. As you saw, we, we considered the antiplatelet arm and the blood pressure arms uh, separately for our power calculation. However, the DSMB suggested that we uh, assess the interaction at interim time points and at the end of the study. So what if the assumption of no significant interaction was wrong? Well, if we still assume that there's a 25% reduction due to combination antiplatelet therapy, but only in one of our blood pressure target groups, which is what an interaction would imply, then the interaction has a differing reduction in stroke for the other group. Okay, so if we assume 25% in one, arm, one blood pressure arm, the difference would have to be significant in order to have a significant interaction. So the power for detecting that interaction is a function of the, the reduction in the second group. And if we're wrong, our power in that second group could be as low as, our power to detect the interaction, excuse me, could be as low as 8% or as high as 87%. So the prospect of an interaction really could have implications for power at the end of our study. So our original statistical analysis plan specified that we would do two interim analyses, as I alluded to in our sample size calculation, for efficacy after one-third and two-thirds of the primary events were collected. And we specified a hay biddle PETA monitoring boundary. This is a very conservative boundary that ensures that we have more of our alpha to spend at the end of the study. So very unlikely that we might stop at an interim time point unless we saw a huge effect. However, at the first uh, Data and Safety Monitoring Board, or DSMB meeting, they recommended that we monitor futility as well. So this is actually about the time that I came to UAB. So the, the people who preceded me as the statistical support in this trial um, were dealing with some of these issues when I came to UAB. So the first thing I did was try to address this question. How should futility be monitored in a two by two factorial design? There isn't a lot of literature about monitoring futility in a, in a factorial design. So this is really a multiplicity issue, and it just so happens that my research happens to be multiplicity in clinical trials. So this was a good fit for me when I got to UAB. So the way we, we perceive this, if one treatment arm is deemed futile, patients would still be recruited and followed in the other treatment arm. So in a single arm, clinical trial, if, so, if, your, if your treatment is deemed futile, you would stop recruitment and you would proceed to analyses. But in this case, that's not necessarily true. Further, because the DSMB suggested it, the possibility of an interaction should be incorporated. So we didn't anticipate one, but if one's there, it would be incorrect to report results without considering the interaction. So we felt that we need to develop a monitoring plan that addressed both of these issues. So again, the way we viewed the problem, we felt that there were two possible paths we could take. We could conduct a separate futility analysis in each arm and not take into consider consideration the possibility of an interaction. Or we could assess a futility in the interaction initially, proceeding only to assess each arm if there's no, no interaction or if we deemed the interaction futile. Okay, so the first approach, we don't consider the interaction when we assess each arm independently. The second approach, we look at the interaction, assess futility there, and sort of in a step-down fashion go on to consider each arm only after ruling out futility. So we performed a simulation study to compare the properties of different ways of monitoring futility. So our first approach was to monitor futility separately and then continue randomizing to both arms even if one is deemed futile and then stop for futility only if both arms are simultaneously deemed 
futile. Now, I'll admit, under review, this paper's gotten a lot of criticism for this because depending on the reason, so, so futility is not considered in a vacuum. And so safety is considered at the same time. And going into SPS3, there is clear evidence there might be some concern about hemorrhages with this combination therapy. And so we knew that we would be monitoring safety at the same time. And so in fact, in SPS3, it isn't clear that you would have wanted to continue randomizing to both arms because there might have been safety concerns. So I'm gonna proceed as if that, that were a non-issue, knowing that in the context of the study, we would be reviewing, or the DSMB would be reviewing both safety and futility simultaneously. The second approach is to assess futility in the interaction first, and then assess futility in each arm only if the interaction is deemed futile. So remember, we didn't design the study to have an interaction. We don't anticipate one. So we, we would feel there's a high probability that there would be futility in the interaction. And then stop for futility only if both arms are simultaneously deemed futile. So again, in terms of stopping the study altogether, we would only stop if both arms are deemed futile. So we did. We simulated 5,000 data sets from a Gaussian distribution under several different uh, conditions. So the first was completely null, no interaction at all, no treatment effect in either arm. Then we sort of stepped it up and looked at whether we had a treatment, uh, assumed we had a treatment effect in one arm, but no interaction. So we had a main effect in one of our arms, but no interaction. The next level up would be one, uh, a main effect in each arm, but no interaction. And then we considered two cases where we had interaction. So the first is what is most likely to be seen in a, in a clinical trial. This is a quantitative interaction. And so this is our typical case where the difference uh, for treatment B at level B, big B, differs from the difference at treatment B level little b. Okay, so that's your difference in differences and your standard interaction that you expect in a, in a clinical trial. The qualitative interaction, or I call it the crisscross interaction, is where your treatment effect sizes are the same, but they're in opposite directions, okay? So in this case, if you don't look at your interaction, you would never really see that there's a difference because on average, these differences are the same, okay? So we determined treatment effects such that we had 80% power to detect a treatment difference at the end of the study. We assumed a type run error rate of 5%, and a standard deviation of one. We looked at a small sample, at the small sample properties, and assumed a sample size of 150. We did a one-sided main effect, so this was a delta of 0.41, given all of these conditions above, and a two-sided interaction with a delta of 0.46. We performed um, our futility analyses after a third and two-thirds of the patients were randomized. Now this is slightly a different scenario than what's in SPS3. SPS3 is an event-driven event trial in theory. So we were looking at our events in order to determine when the interim analyses would be held. In this case, we, we assumed that uh, outcomes were, were uh, observed quickly after recruitment. So we based it on recruitment rather than on our outcomes. And we computed conditional power um, in order to determine futility. So conditional power to me is the single most intuitive statistical concept. It's the, it's the uh, conditional probability that you reject the null hypothesis at the end of the study given the data that you've collected so far and the future data. So working with clinicians, I find that this is what clinicians think we're doing a lot of the time with p-values. We're looking at the probability of something. In this case, we really are. We're looking at the probability that you reject the null hypothesis given theta and your observed data so far. So theta is the parameter describing the treatment difference in the future data. The remainder of these uh, symbols are our test statistic at the end of the study, um, our critical value at the end of the study, and then the test statistic so far. So essentially we're projecting forward, given what we've seen so far, okay, to determine whether or not we're likely to reject the null hypothesis. The difficulty is that we have to find some way to describe theta, which describes our, our future data, our unobserved data. And there are many ways to do so, and there's a lot of literature about this. So we looked at three different ways. 
Um, keeping it in a frequentist um, uh, approach, we looked at the hypothesized effect size. So the original conditional power approach used your hypothesis effect size. What was that delta that you originally powered your study to see? We also used the upper limit of the observed 80% confidence interval around our observed effect size at the time of the interim analysis, and we used the observed effect size. So this gives us a range of values um, from what we're seeing currently to something that we anticipate will be larger than um, what we're seeing currently. Now that's not always the case. It's possible that your hypothesized effect size, what you plan the study to detect, is actually smaller than what you're seeing in your study, but, but it's actually fairly rare. We use a futility index of 80% for main effects, implying that if we had 80% uh, 20% conditional power, that that would be an indication we might want to stop early for futility. I should say, this was a rule for the simulation. When we applied this in, in, the, in the study, it was more of a guideline. We used the futility of an index of 50% for an interaction. So we were a little more conservative with the interaction because we felt like because it wasn't power to detect the interaction, that if one was there, we didn't want to miss the possibility. Okay, so this table provides the percentage of studies that were stopped early for futility when the conditional power is computing, use, computed using the hypothesized effect size. So the rows represent the different situations that we simulated in terms of the treatment effect. The um, columns represent the methods of assessing futility. And so what we looked at here was at the first and second look after a third and two-thirds of our data were collected what proportion of the time or what percentage of our simulated studies did we stop early? And so what we found was that we almost never stopped early after the first look. So this is okay. Even when there's no effect there, we've only collected a third of our data. So what's happening is the future data are overwhelming the current data, okay? However, by the time we get to two-thirds of the data at the second look, we're more likely to stop the study early. And you can see that we're more likely to stop the study early for the um, null case, which is good. There's no difference there. We'd, we'd want to stop the study early. And for the case when there's a qualitative interaction and we don't assess the interaction first. Okay, so in fact, these would be type 1 errors. Because in fact, there would be a treatment effect. It's just being masked by the qualitative interaction. When we assess the interaction first, we're, it's very rare that we would stop the study early for future. The, the next table shows the percentage of studies where a correct decision was made and the average sample number. So approximately how many patients on average would be enrolled in the study had we carried out the study in this fashion. And again, the table is situated in the same way. The different, uh, the different scenarios we simulated are in the rows and the different methods of assessing, assessing futility are in the columns. And what you can see is that under the completely null we uh, make the correct decision about 93% of the time. So we were a little baffled by this at first because we, uh, we designed the simulation to have a 5% alpha level. So we expected this to be 95%, um, but then we realized we weren't making corrections for multiple testing and we're doing subgroup tests essentially. So we, we believe that the reduction in, or the, the inflation in type one error that we're seeing is due to not correcting our multiple tests. In general, we do pretty well. We assumed 80% power, and so in general, when we have treatment effects in one arm or two arms, we do pretty well in terms of making the correct decision. However, we pretty much always go to the end of the study. Okay, in the, at the same vein, if we have a qualitative interaction, we do pretty well as well, and we pretty much always go to the end of the study. On the other hand, if we have the crossover interaction, we find a reduction in power. We don't make a correct decision as frequently, regardless of how we monitor futility. But we also don't expose as many patients to the study, to the, to the fetal drug, if you will. So essentially, when, con when considering futility in both treatment arms simulta simultaneously, as I mentioned, it's unlikely that the study will stop early, even under the null hypothesis. However, we are making a correct decision as often as we we found, we concluded that there was little benefit to including the interaction monitoring initially. 
that the average sample number was the same or larger than when we assessed futility in each arm separately, and the correct decision was made the same proportion of the time. So the benefits came in, in the unlikely case of the crossover interaction. And we felt as investigators that that should be addressed during the plan fa planning phase of the study. Now, clearly, you can never guess what's going to happen in your data. Every data set is different, and issues arise in every study. However, we felt that this was a very unlikely situation for our study. And I, I should, should add that similar pattern, patterns were obtained using the estimated effects for the future data that were either uh, the 80% limit of confidence interval or the observed effect. So, so based on this, oh, so based on this, we, we drew up a plan for the DSMB that, that monitored each arm separately. Um, subsequently, the DSMB asked us to monitor the interaction as well. So even though we found that it wasn't going to be much benefit in futility, they were more concerned about the efficacy outcome in terms of the interaction. So we all, whenever we did our interim analyses for our DSMB, we also assessed the interaction during that time. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here for some, another aspect of the study that we had a statistical um, a neat statistical issue come up. So let me see if there are any questions about this, or I'm happy to take them at the end, and then I'll move on to the sort of changing years a little bit. Okay, so I either did a really poor job of explaining it or a really good job. Ralph, yeah? yeah. So the interaction is something interesting to talk about here. Yes. Your outcome was ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, yes. right? Yes. So for the clinical audience, combination antiplatelets has been shown to increase the risk of hemorrhage. Right. Higher blood pressure can increase the risk of hemorrhage. So you may not have an interaction, at least uh, theoretically, on the efficacy of right. ischemic stroke, but it's the hemorrhagic stroke that would concern me. How would you have dealt with that? That's a really good question. Actually, whenever we presented um, safety data to the DSMB, I think I can talk about this now because the study is seven patients from being over, we, we broke it out by all four treatment combinations. And so they were able, although they were blinded to what those treatments were, they were able to see if there were differing patterns across the different treatment arms. And so we were able to look at that. Um, and it is an interesting conundrum because we, we do know that there is a higher risk, and, and actually Oscars presented that the increased risk of hemorrhage was twice for the, the combination group than for the single therapy group. But the ischemic stroke is a little bit predictive, although not significantly so. So whenever we did, so we had separate safety analyses than efficacy analyses. And when we did efficacy analyses, we looked at those individually as well. And statistically, you know, ischemic probably outnumber hemorrhagic. Quite a bit. And the blood pressure ranges are still pretty on the low side. They are. To the high blood pressure would increase hemorrhage probably numbers wise would be small. Right. And when we prepare when we've been preparing the antiplatelet paper, we have been looking at the interactions. Uh, we actually left them out of the paper, but uh, the reviewers reminded us. So we've been looking at those interactions and to ensure that I mean essentially long story, but we ended I'll get to this at the end, but we ended the antiplatelet therapy arm early for safety concerns and lack of efficacy. So now we are in the situation where patients one arm was being terminated but the, we are still following the patients for the other arm. So if there had been an interaction, we would have had to end the, anti or the blood pressure arm then too because the data we collected were, would have not provided any additional information. Or in a funny way, they would have been hard to analyze. So. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears here and talk a little bit about an adaptive, an adaptation we made to the study while it was ongoing. So recall that SPS3 was designed such that we assumed a 7% rate of recurrent stroke for the aspirin group, and that we assumed a 25% relative risk reduction or in the combination due to the combination therapy with 90% power, and a 20% reduction, sorry, not in the relative risk in the event rate, attributable to the combination therapy with 80%. SPS3 began in 2003. As Sherry mentioned, I was still at the University of Michigan at that time. Since that time, several studies have come out showing recurrent. So we use the WARS study, or they use the 
Explorer study to plan SPS3. And so you can see that the, 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 um, uh, these are stroke recurrent rates per year from several different studies. You can see that over time, these appear to be decreasing. Now, all of these studies were not combination antiplatelet therapy studies per se, but many of them assessed rates of, um, of recurrent stroke with different types of therapy, aspirin alone, some of them, other uh, anticoagulants. And so we, we saw this trend in the literature that was coming out over time. And in fact, several publications have come out discussing why is the stroke recurrent rate in clinical trials decreasing over time. And so these data cause concerns among the SPS3 investigators. If there is a smaller than expected event rate in our population, this could result in an underpowered study. So the SPS3 steering committee petitioned to our DSMB to ask that we be allowed to know the overall event rate in the study. And so the way the SPS3 is operated, the statistical center is independent of the clinical center and the clinical coordinating center. And so while we saw blinded data that, that told us what the event rate was, the study investigators were unaware of what the overall event rate was in the study. So given the literature that was emerging, the, S, or the DSMB accepted the request and recommended that we use that information to assess the impact of modifying the study design so that we would be able to have a definitive answer at the end of the study with sufficient power. So we did an unplanned um, sample size re-estimation and considered the following design modifications. And I'll tell you about the event rates in a minute. So we looked at what would happen given the observed event rate at this time and the planned study design, which was 2,500 patients with one year follow-up after the last patient was recruited. We considered increasing just the follow-up time to two additional years at the end of the last patient recruitment, increasing the sample size only, so increasing the sample size to 3,000 and then following patients from one year past the end of recruitment, and then a combination of these, increasing the sample size to 3,000 and then uh, having two additional years of follow-up time after the end of the last recruitment. So I should tell you that SPS3 began in 2003 and was designed to be a five-year study total. We planned for a three-year follow-up. At the time we did this, I believe it was 2009 or 10. So we'd already been following patients six and seven years who planned to be in the study three to five. So we were trying to consider statistically what the impact of doing this was, while at the same time trying to manage study fatigue from investigators, from clinical coordinators, and from patients. So again, we performed a simulation study to compare these first three designs. So we ruled out that last, going to 3,000 patients with two years of follow-up, because we felt that it would, we, it would extend the study timeline beyond what was feasible. Um, in fact, the funding agency had already given us a, an extension and some extra money to keep going, and we knew we'd be asking for too much, even though that would probably give us the best power. So at the time we did this, we had 2,081 patients enrolled in red already, and we used our current enrollment trends at the time of the simulation to simulate those patients. So essentially, we used their data for those first 2,081 patients. And then we simulated the remaining patients based on other trends in the study. So at that time, we were recruiting 25 patients per month among all our clinical sites. We also looked at the impact of recruiting a little more quickly, 30 patients per month, and more slowly, 20 patients per month. We simulated our failure and censoring times using an exponential distribution, assuming the overall rate of um, events to be that observed in SPS3 at the time of the simulations. At that time, we saw an overall event rate of 3.4% annually. So remember, we powered the study to have approximately a 6.25% annual event rate. So it's considerably lower than what was anticipated. We also looked at the lower and upper confidence intervals around that rate at the time of this sample size estimation. We, we continued to assume our initially planned treatment difference for our um, each arm. And so remember that was a 25% reduction in uh, recurrent stroke. And so given this 3.4% overall rate, that led to a 3.9% rate in the, com uh, in the monotherapy arm and a 2.9% rate in the combination therapy arm. 
So our goal was to assess the impact of modifying the study design midstream on the type 1 error rate and on our power for a primary comparison. Okay, so this table provides the type 1 error rates from our simulation assessing this, these different design changes in the study. So the first column is our sample size. The second column is the number of patients per month that would be recruited for the remaining months of the study. And then the additional years of follow-up time after the last patient was recruited. <coughs> uh, there's a lot of literature about uh, sample size reestimation and the impact on the type 1 error rate. The prevailing theory is that if you don't look at the estimated treatment effect, that the, the um, sample size reestimation in large samples generally has little impact on the type 1 error rate. And we found that all, for all the scenarios we simulated, that the type 1 error rate was within the standard error of our simulation. So the, thing, the one thing that did baffle us was that there don't seem to be any trends here, but we saw a little bit of an increasing trend here that we kind of chalked up to randomness. So, but it's still within the error of the simulation. So we were, we were relieved to find that if we did make one of these modifications, we wouldn't be inflating our type 1 error rate. This figure presents the power, assuming the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval around the observed rate, which was 2.9%. The red bars are if we had 2,500 patients uh, with, with one year additional follow-up. The yellow bar has 2,500 patients with two years additional follow-up. And the blue bar is 3,000 patients with one year additional follow-up. And the different uh, blocks of bars are for the number of patients per month recruited. And so what we found was that in the worst case scenario, we'd have about 60% power. And that the power was only slightly impacted by the recruitment per month. And if you can see in this figure, there's a slight decreasing trend in the power the more quickly you, re you recruit patients. The, the re reason for this is that the total follow-up time is decreased if you recruit patients more quickly. Um, this is the same figure, but now assuming the overall event rate, this was the 3.4% rate, and we saw that the power was slightly increased from the last figure. And in fact, that in this case here, this 3,000 patients followed for one more year after recruitment, and recruiting slowly, we actually get to about 80% power. And it decreases from there slightly. And then if the event rate's even higher, then this power goes up and we see the same trends. And so we felt fairly comfortable that we could choose to extend the, um, to increase the sample size, and that if, if this difference were there, we would be able to detect it. So based on these results, the SPS3 steering committee recommended to the DSMB and the funding institute that we recruit an additional 500 patients, increase the sample size to 3,000, and follow them for an additional year after the close of recruitment. We concluded that it did not impact the type 1 error rate and that we would have improved power compared to the current design. So we would have about 75% power and a range of 66 to 82% power. This was approved both by the DSMB and uh, the, the study sponsor and was implemented after lengthy discussions among the study investigators. And so because we did not affect or we did not assess the treatment effect at the time of our sample size reestimation, this should not bias our, um, our, our results at the end of the study. So there's a lot of literature about sample size reestimation and using only uh, nuisance parameters versus reassessing your treatment difference. We base ours on the planned treatment difference, not the observed treatment difference. Remember, the only parameter we use the data to, to estimate is the overall event rate, which is a nuisance parameter. So I'd be, I'd be, it'd be wrong if I didn't point out that this was not just based on statistical input and that there were many practical issues that arose that we needed to address before we could implement this. So this, this caused a change to the study protocol that led to changes to the site IRBs and contracts. Now we are increasing the amount of time that we would be doing the study and the, the patients could only, had only consented for a certain amount of time. We had to extend patient follow-up. Some of them had to reconsent. Uh, we had to change forms allowing for additional study visits. 
we needed to secure funding to allow for extending the study. So NINDS, the Stroke Institute, had approved us to make this modification, but that's a separate decision from whether we could have the money to do it. We needed to change contracts for study person personnel. We needed to, and we needed really to address issues of study fatigue. Um, not only among the study staff, many of whom had been working on the study for eight years at this point, but some of the patients who had been enrolled for eight years at this point. So we had a lot of non-statistical issues that we needed to discuss and, and address as well. So in, in the context of SPS3, we successfully assessed and implemented, Im, implemented a futility analysis plan in a 2 by 2 factorial design randomized clinical trial. We used simulations to determine which approach had the most opti optimal statistical properties, and we coupled those with practical aspects of our study design to implement this monitoring plan. plan. In addition, we successfully implemented an un unplanned study adaptation that was motivated by external data, and we again used simulations to assess the statistical properties of these study modifications well, again, coupling that with the practical implications for an ongoing trial. So where are we now? So as I alluded to, SPS3, since we've done this work, SPS3 has had some really interesting developments. So we closed recruitment in April of 2011, a little over a year ago, with 3,020 participants enrolled. It was really exciting after a long time of enrollment to, to reach that milestone. Um, about four months later, three months later, during our DSMB meeting, the decision was made to terminate the antiplatelet arm. So I alluded to this. Due to concerns regarding safety, as well as a lack of efficacy. So in fact, those futility monitoring uh, strategies that we came up with were implemented and led to early stopping due to futility. Um, so this brings up new and interesting statistical questions. As I mentioned, had there been an interaction stopping one arm and not the other really creates a lot of an analytic problems. We also had to think through very carefully how are we going to analyze the antiplatelet data and the blood pressure data given that the antiplatelet data ended last August and the blood pressure data are ending today. Okay. Um, the results of the antiplatelet trial were presented at the International Stroke Conference this past February and are now have been revised and are under re-review at the New England Journal of Medicine, so we're really excited to get this out in the literature. Clearly, the, the primary result's well known because we stopped early for a lack of efficacy. There's some other interesting subgroup, um, or other interesting safety outcomes that, that have some interesting questions that are gonna be brought up because of them. And again, given that we stopped for safety as well as lack of efficacy, that's not surprising. The termination of the blood pressure arm is underway. We have today, as of today, seven patients left to close out. And so we're working hard to adjudicate all of our, uh, all of our events, get all our data clean so that we can begin the blood pressure analyses as well. So we're really excited to bring this to fruition after so much, both clinically and statistically, that's gone into this study. So I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators um, who have helped me with some of this work, who have worked with me, Doctors George Howard and Chris Coffey, who uh, they were the people who were working on the, the analysis plan when I came to UAB, and then the sample size reestimation. Doctors Chris Coffey again and Jeff Sykowski, who are two of my colleagues in SPS3. Um, the members of the SPS3 steering committee actually gave us su such great input that the the spirit of collaboration in this study has been phenomenal. And then the DSMB also, we've had very interesting and enlightening conversations with them on many occasions about the, the statistical aspects and how to balance those with the clinical aspects of the study. And then of course I have to acknowledge the NIH for funding all of this research for so long. Thank you and I'd be happy to take any additional questions.